So now we're going to start actually looking at how we take what we discussed last week, which is how to actually use transistors to create uh, CPU, to create memory, to create all the individual components uh, like latches and, and ALUs. Uh, and now we're going to step up a level and see how we take those components uh, and how they communicate together. Uh, it's going to require us to define the path between them. Uh, that's uh, the bus, which we'll, we'll talk about in general. Um, but really what we're going to do now is, is kind of build this physical component, uh, but we're also at the same time going to see how the instructions are created that manipulate the physical component. Uh, remember we said, especially in what we've been dealing with since Little Man Computer, is that an instruction set architecture, right, is the combination of the hardware and the instruction set. And we said that both of these things have to be designed together because it's the instruction set that controls the hardware, right? So that's a very important component of this. So we're going to start with the hardware. Uh, that's what we're going to discuss in this video. And then we're going to start talking about the actual instructions themselves and how they manipulate the hardware. Um, We've kind of talked through most of the base concepts of this already using Little Man Computer. Now we're going to transition this stuff into reality to see how we use this theory to build an actual machine. A uh, little bit of review. So remember that uh, CPU itself is kind of the uh, complete component that contains things like an ALU, which is our arithmetic logic unit. Uh, we know that the ALU, right, further uh, subdivides what it can do. Uh, it performs uh, both mathematics and logical operations, right? Uh, it also produces flags and things of that nature. We've talked through that. Um, but we're also going to look now more deeply at the control unit, which we've talked at a very high level about before. We know that this is the unit that gets the instruction and then uh, proceeds to perform fetch, decode, execute, uh, whatnot within the cycle. But we're going to examine that in much more detail today. In fact, a good piece of what we will be talking about uh, as the data path is in fact the control unit. It's the hardware that takes the instruction and uses it to affect the, the result that we want to have. Um, other subcomponents that we'll look at, uh, how do we interface with memory? So remember last time we talked about uh, the MAR and the MDR as being uh, special purpose registers that uh, we use to send an address to memory um, and get data out, right? So we're going to be using those a lot uh, in this talk So and other registers that we talked about as well. Uh, as components that we're going to use uh, as part of the data path to affect all these changes. Uh, there's also the I.O. interface. So when we talked about Little Man Computer and we had our inbox and outbox and said, this is just kind of a, a vague placeholder for all the ways that our uh, computer might want to uh, interact with, with the rest of the world, so to speak. Um, you know, we were using it to basically just give a number and, and get a number out without really specifying if it was going to a screen or, or a network or how that was being handled. Um, and we also said that in a real computer uh, where we had 901 and 902 in Little Man Computer, really the 01 and the 02 represented an address of an I.O. component, just like a memory address represented the mailbox. Um, and that is more in line with how I.O. actually works. Um, we're going to talk about the I.O. interface at a basic level here, but there's a whole upcoming component of this course that dives more deeply into I.O. itself. So uh, some of that will wait until we get further down the road, uh, but we will talk about it at a high level here. The most important thing to, to kind of talk about in this segment is the bus. Now, um, not the bus you get on and, and, you know, back in the day went to school on or now, you know, maybe go to, um, you know, get your groceries or toilet paper or whatever. Um, but the bus that uh, our computer uses to connect all these physical components. So we've talked about these registers. We have the program counter. We have the instruction register. We have 
general purpose registers, we have the ALU, we have the memory address register, the memory data register, right? We have all these different components, but we need a way to link them together. Uh, we know that there's maybe an address bus because we know that we have to get an address to something like the memory address register. And we know that maybe there's a data bus that maybe we get information from. But we've never really defined what these things are. We can probably conclude, you know, from, from our current level of knowledge that they're, you know, some kind of wiring, some kind of conductor that transmits information from one side to another in the form of electricity. Uh, and that would be an accurate assumption, right? But we're going to do a little bit more to, to better define that and to really lock that down. So a bus is a group of electrical or optical connectors that carry that signal from one location to another. It's that physical connection that makes it possible for us to, to make any of this work. Um, one term that you'll hear a lot is a line. So a bus line is just a single conductor on the bus. Um, you might have more than one bus line, and we're going to talk more about that as we, we get further in. Um, some other characteristics, oh, hi, Bella's here. Uh, some other characteristics of a bus, um, you know, there are definitely different numbers of lines that can be associated. Um, for right now, I'm going to talk through examples in what would be considered a parallel bus, which means that you would have one conductor or line for each um, bit that you want to transfer. Now, there can be additional ones. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. But for right now, let's just say that you can have multiple wires, obviously, on the same bus. Um, Having multiple wires allows you to send information simultaneously. So if I have uh, an 8-bit bus and I have 8 wires, then I could hypothetically send all 8 bits at the same time. And I wouldn't have to say send them one right after the other. It would be the equivalent of having a bus on the road with one seat and 8 passengers. Uh, and they'd all have to take separate trips versus having a bus with 8 seats and all 8 passengers get to go on the bus at the same time. We're going to talk about the uh, the, the bus in terms of how we can uh, describe it and how we can, um, you know, put actual uh, data points on its performance and its capacity and its throughput. Uh, basically, that's the amount of data that we're going to be able to transfer on our bus. Um, the distance will form something called latency. Um, that's actually going to become really important as we, especially once we leave the processor. Um, but we'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, we're also going to talk about the type of control that we're using for this bus, its defined purpose, uh, and its features and capabilities as we go through. So we talked about all buses having lines, but there are actually different types of lines. So there are four different types of signals that we might want to send over a bus. Now, these might constitute, say, like it is possible you could send um, different voltage levels for say, for some of these. So for example, a good example that would be power. Um, a bus might actually carry different voltage levels uh, for different power requirements, say 3.3 uh, volts versus 5 volts, that kind of thing. Uh, but for the most part, that's not going to be the case. And the physical properties of sending these signals are not necessarily any different. It's the purpose of why we're using the bus um, sometimes we will use the bus to transmit data. Other times we will use the bus to transmit a address for a memory or an I.O. piece. Uh, we might use the bus to actually transmit a control signal. So what if we want the ALU to perform a particular operation, say like add versus subtract? The bus lines we use to actually make that change, not to give it the numbers to add or subtract, that would be a form of a data bus, but to actually tell the ALU that it's performing an add versus subtract, that would be sent on a control bus. So that would be considered a control signal. Um, and we could also use a bus to transmit power. So if we need to actually provide power to a component, uh, at a certain voltage level. Uh, a bus is yet another way we could do that. Uh, you actually see this manifest in your daily life the most, and this is obviously very much outside the CPU, but we're all familiar with it, when you use USB. So USB has actually uh, multiple lines in it that 
serve multiple purposes. So it is perfectly capable of sending addresses and it sends data. Uh, it also sends power in addition to everything else it does. So if you've ever used a component that was powered off of USB, you're using the power lines in that USB bus. Now, for now, we're going to be concentrating inside the CPU, but there's nothing about the term bus that restricts it to being inside the CPU. Uh, buses are used to uh, you know, link components on a grander scale within your computer as well. So your CPU is linked to your memory over a bus, as is um, your I.O. controllers and your hard drive and all those other components. And any external components that you want to link to your computer are also connected over a bus. Sometimes external like USB, sometimes internal um, like, you know, the old SCSI or IDEs, or we'll get into that. Um, so that is the, the types of buses that we'll have to work with. Uh, internally now, which is where we're going to be concentrating, a uh, internal bus uh, generally may have, you know, say 32 data lines and one control line. Um, this would be just one example, right? Now this is probably in a 32-bit machine. I'm going to try to keep the numbers under control here, but be aware that, you know, we also have 64-bit machines, which are way more prevalent now than even 32-bit machines. Mm -hmm. Even our phones are 64 bits now. So this can add up to quite a lot of lines, obviously, and we'll talk more about that in a moment as well. Uh, a very important bus to us is our memory bus. So remember we said the CPU and memory are actually two different components, but they work so closely together that we kind of treat them uh, mentally sometimes as, as a team uh, for the purpose of uh, getting our actual instruction, right? Because all of our instructions reside in memory and they need to actually be given to the CPU so that we can uh, work with them. And we also do loads and stores and all kinds of operations all the time that work very closely with memory. So obviously this bridge between the CPU and memory is going to be very, very important to us. Uh, we've also talked about the memory address register and the memory data register last time. So remember that the memory address register is the register that's going to hold a memory address that we wish to access from memory. And the memory data register is going to be the register that is going to uh, contain the data that we get back uh, once we have read from memory, or it will contain the data that maybe we want to write to memory as well.